I was really, really flattered the conference organisers did not ask me what I was going to talk about this uh, today, which was great because um, one of the principles I believe in is real options. And it meant that I could experiment with some new ideas and a new talk while knowing that I could always fall back on BDD if I needed to. <laughs> so um, today I wanted to talk about forgiveness over permission. And this is actually chapter three in a long journey. So in a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away called Scotland, um, I did a talk on respect. And I followed it up with a talk on honesty at Go to Our House. And the idea about these talks is we keep looking at these human values and getting people to behave in good ways. And we love it when people are respectful and people are honest. And I have a theory which challenges this idea a little bit. So I'd like to introduce that theory to you. My theory is that when you push on reality, reality pushes back harder. If you actually have to be respectful and honest and think about it and try and do it, rather than it happening naturally, it's because there's something wrong with your system. So today I'm going to look at forgiveness as a principle, but one of the things I want to look at is forgiving systems. It turns out that there's a class of people who've been doing forgiving systems for a while. This is a book I picked up on uh, Universal Principles of Design. And UX people, hands up UX people. One, one UX person, welcome. <laughs> okay, so it turns out that forgiveness is something that UX people are quite familiar with. So I want to introduce a few ideas about around forgiveness in design to you, just to get you to think about what forgiveness in a system might look like. Okay, so first of all, we have what's called affordances. And affordances are things which make um, systems look familiar because it makes them easier to use. So for instance, when you hover over the save button, it turns into a button-like thing so you know you can press it. And it's got this icon of a floppy disk because that's familiar to absolutely everybody as a save thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> they were a lot bigger than that when I started uh, developing. Um, we have constraints. Now, constraints are things which stop you using things in the wrong way. So all of these came from things I was doing while I was actually making this presentation. So a lot of them are from PowerPoint. You'll notice that the text area is greyed out because I didn't have any text selected. And when I select text, then suddenly it all comes back again. So it helps me stop using it in the wrong way. Um, if you're at this hotel, by the way, uh, you'll notice that there are two plug points in the bathroom where the hairdryer is. Neither of them work with the hairdryer. If you want to find the plug point for the hairdryer, it's above the towel rail underneath the flap. <laughs> okay? It's not good UX design. Right. Um, confirmations. Uh, so, when I want to overwrite something, it asks me, are you sure you want to do that? Now, you'll notice it's not stopping me from doing that. It's just making sure I'm aware that there's something unusual going on there. And the same with these warnings. If I decide I really want to spell forgiveness with four S's, it will let me. <laughs> but it will just let me know. That's probably not what I want to be doing. Reversible actions. How many of you just hit Control Z without thinking about it while you're coding? Yeah? It's that intuitive to us, reversible actions. And this is actually one of the things I want to look at in a bit more detail later. Uh, and safety net. So this is actually from Dropbox. If you, if you use Dropbox at all, if I edit something on my computer at home and then edit it on this little laptop at the same time, Dropbox will actually just save it in a different place. And it will give it a name like this so that you don't lose your work. And that's a safety net. And then we've got the help. So when you hover over things, it gives you some guidance on how to use it, and you can press F1 if you want to get more help. Okay, so those are pretty simple um, ideas for how you might go about um, getting forgiveness into a system. I want to talk about another system. This is feature injections. This is how I think of projects and teams of people and how they interact. Um, this is very similar to and slightly different to impact mapping. Okay? So if you come across Goico Adjects impact mapping, it's not dissimilar to that. So 
So the idea is we have a primary stakeholder. And this primary stakeholder either makes money, saves money, or protects money with their idea, their vision that they want. But to get this vision live, there are other stakeholders involved. And these other stakeholders have their own goals. They might be goals around security, they might be legal things, might be auditing if you're doing trades, um, if you're the guardian and you want to comment on an article, they might be the moderator who has to worry about spam. But they have goals that need to be met before you can go live. Okay, so then we have capabilities. So to deliver the goals, we're going to give some capabilities to people. And this is where you get business analysts and business experts involved. They understand what capabilities different teams, different departments will need to meet the goals for the project, which we don't have apparently anymore. Um, features, so actual concrete things that we deliver with the UI. And we break those down into stories so we can get fast feedback. And if you're doing BDD, you've got lovely scenarios and you might talk through some examples and then you come up with some code. And it turns into reality. So that's the dev team. Okay, this is the dev team over here. And then we've got these stakeholders. Now the stakeholders want to use the dev team to get a project done, to get a product made, to get something they want. So you can see we've got this nice interface here. We've got a user interface. My friend Eric Willicke described it as um, a project experience. So we're going to give these guys a project experience, like a user experience, through this interface. And I want to have a little look at what a really great dev team might look like. So, a system is anything, any group, any part of something else which interacts with another part. So the dev team are going to interact with the stakeholders. The stakeholders might have customers. There are systems within the systems. So when I'm talking about a system, I'm talking about the way in which people interact with people outside of that group. Okay? Just be really clear. Um, in this system, we also have a certified product owner. And I'm using a certified product owner because if I was actually using a genuine experienced product owner, this wouldn't be half as much fun. <laughs> this person has probably been on a course, maybe has a little bit of experience acting as a product owner. They're actually not the real product owner. The person who really owns the product is that, that, that vision creating primary stakeholder, the person who championed the idea in the first place, the person who's fought for the budget. So this lady is acting as the proxy and just to make it even more fun, we're going to have a certified Scrum Master as well. Again, if it's a real Scrum Master, it's not half as much fun. Um, and I could tell you how this team becomes the best dev team in the world, but it's actually more fun to do it from the perspective of what the worst dev team ever looks like. So I'm going to show you how this team manages to violate all the principles of forgiveness that we just looked at while maintaining their Scrum and Agile. And I will warn you now, these, these things I'm going to give you are all real things that I have seen with teams and more than one team. And some of them are going to make you feel uncomfortable because you do some of them as well. Okay? So let's look at the affordances, things which look like reality. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put numbers on the card. Not words. Because we use JIRA, right? So this is, these, are, these are numbers from JIRA, and then we put the numbers on the card and we put them on board. Right? And if you're using post-its, you don't have room for much more than just a number. <laughs> so you end up with these numbers going across the board. We're also going to um, use this word, done. Because that represents reality, right? <laughs> We get to define what done actually means. It's wonderful. We get, to, we get to come up with a different definition of done to what the whole of the rest of the English speakers in the world consider done to be. And just in case we weren't divorced enough from reality, we're going to estimate in story points. <coughs> what now? Story points. They have no bearing, no relationship with reality. 
In fact, if you've ever tracked a team's velocity against the number of stories and, and looked at how long the stories actually took compared to how long the stories really took, the only teams that I have found that actually consistently come up with consistent velocity and consistent metrics are the ones who pad the estimates. And they probably use the extra bit of time to get some refactoring done. I can see a couple of people nodding. Have a think about this. Next time you're actually looking at getting more accurate estimates, first of all, if you've got accurate estimates, it means that 50% of them should be too short and 50% too long, right? That, that would show you that your estimates were about right. But what people tend to do is they tend to go, actually, we didn't meet our estimates, therefore our estimates are too short, so they tend to get longer. And teams tend to make the estimates longer and longer over time because now you can guarantee that you're going to get your stuff in on time. And you become great at meeting your commitments and getting that velocity at the end of every week. But it's not actually bearing any relation to reality. Let's look at constraints. This is a real team I was talking to. I was actually asked to go and help them pair program. Um, they had no constraints on their board whatsoever, no limits to their work in progress. Um, there were four devs on the team, 12 things in progress. That's amazing. I, I find it difficult some days to type with both hands at the same time, let alone to type on three different keyboards. And I was being asked to help these guys pair program which would mean they were actually working on six things at once, <laughs> each. Okay, but it gets worse because we haven't just removed constraints on the things in progress, we've removed constraints on the whole backlog. So what usually happens is that a certain subsection of the backlog gets chosen to be carried out this sprint and our proxy product owner, our certified product owner is busy breaking down the whole of the rest of the backlog which is usually a little bit bigger than that. In fact, it's usually much bigger than that. <laughs> I have been in rooms where all four walls were covered in tiny little stories. Again, this bears no relation to re reality. This isn't actually what ends up being delivered. And you can see our poor product owner and our, our, uh, our real product owner and the other stakeholders involved are not particularly happy. They don't know what's going on. Um, if you want to read a blog post on this, by the way, I recommend Dan Norse, The Perils of Estimation. So we were trying to solve a problem. We were trying to solve getting this person's vision out and at the same time looking at the other goals that need to be met. And we've gone from how do we solve this problem to how do we deliver these 325 stories, which will take us a year. Um, and now, of course, because the backlog has become so big, we're not allowed to add things to it, even if we spot things that are missing. We need to have a conversation before we can add things to the backlog. So hands up, devs in the room, if you have ever just done something because it just needed doing, and it was going to take you half a day, and you didn't put it on the board or really tell anybody about it, Okay, that's how many people found it that hard to write a piece of paper and stick it on the board. And it shouldn't be that hard, but sometimes it is. So again, we're not representing reality. Confirmation. So this is saying to people, are you sure you really want to do that? So our vision owning product owner says, you know, please can you do this for me? And our devs go, that doesn't seem sensible. I'm sure there's something missing there. But they don't say anything because it will mean more work and that will mean adding more things to the backlog and we don't want to do that. Warnings. So again, just letting people know that it might not be a good idea. You know, please do this for me. And it says, I wonder if you talk to Sam about this. Because I'm sure Sam must have a thing to say about this. This is Sam, by the way. <laughs> Sam is the incidental stakeholder who's going to stop her from going live. Those are also met. He's got some legal concerns. You're commenting on articles on The Guardian. Have you thought about what might happen if some of those ideas are libelous and defamatory? And we're going to be the ones who get in trouble. Okay. So thanks, Eve. Um, 
This, this is things people tweeted yesterday. They fitted perfectly into this, this project. Um, this is from Eve. Interesting t-shirt. Panic is not an agile methodology. So who, who is the person who is wearing that t-shirt? Fantastic. Thank you for wearing that t-shirt and providing me with this slide. Because it's true. Panic should not be an agile methodology, right? We have an urgent production issue. And an urgent production issue is something the team need to act on immediately. But we have a scrum master, and the scrum master knows about scrum. And what does scrum say? Oh, I'm sorry, you can't disturb the team for two weeks. Well, you can, but you'll have to stop doing scrum. You will have to abandon your sprint. And they say it like it's a bad thing. Remember, these are new Scrum Masters. I'm, I'm sure that experienced people have better ways of coping with this. So we have our urgent production issue. Oh, no. <laughs> I have actually heard this. OK, it was a mock stand-up. It was a mock stand-up. But I actually heard somebody hush a manager who had some really important information that the team needed to act on urgently with hush, you're a chicken. I wrote a blog post the next day called Done With Pigs and Chickens off the back of it. And the day after that, so did Scrub.org. <sighs> okay, reversible actions. Urgent production issues. Really, I mean, this is something which doesn't happen all that much, but when it does, you want to be able to act on it, right? Devs know how to get around this. But we don't always listen to the people on the team who have the ideas and who say things like, guys, wouldn't it be good if we can make ourselves some safety nets, make ourselves some ways of behaving which are forgiving ways of behaving? We've got no rollback. Talking of safety nets, this is a really interesting one. The build must never go red. Do you know what happens when you tell devs that the build must never go red? Apart from the fact that they all secretly install Git subversion bridges. <laughs> Stop checking in, right? You'll find that your, your code is mysteriously now on somebody else's machine. And there's another build going on in the background, which occasionally goes red. And you think that this is not normal. But when Larry Macaron and Carl Scotland did a presentation on metrics, and I've spoken a little bit about this to some people, and they work for Rally, so they've got a lot of customer data, they found when they tracked which days things were checked in on against how long those things had been in progress, they found a massive spike every Monday because devs won't check anything in on a Friday because you don't want the build to fail over the weekend. <laughs> And all the devs are now recognising, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Why is that? Why is our build so unforgiving that we cannot check in? Is it really that difficult to roll back a, a, a thing that we checked in? And help. Now, I was desperately, I was actually going to miss this slide out because I couldn't think of any situation where a product owner would need to ask the team for help. And then this happened. Simon Hardy tweeted, this is bollocks. Signs your product owner is disengaged. For those of you who don't speak English, that's a rude word. <laughs> and I posted back saying, well, surely they're more disengaged when they think it, but don't say it. And he said, only if anyone pays attention to their protestation. Is your heart breaking just a little bit? Because it should be. Poor product owner. They're like, I don't understand this process. I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand how this is helping me get my work done. They're asking for help. And they're being ignored. So is this the worst dev team ever? Or did some of those things actually ring true for you? It's very interesting. I find one of the reasons why we end up with these, uh, these things happening is because these, these two, the, the product owner and the scrum master, become the interface. 
They become a part of the way we engage with the users, with the customers, with the people who genuinely want the product. And they provide permission to the team. And permission basically says one thing. Giving people permission to do something says, if you've got to ask for permission, it says, that person knows better than you. And there are a couple of other times when people give permission or withhold permission. One is governments, who have to deal with all kinds of people, and occasionally, but not always, know better than them. And the other is parents with children. So parents tell children not to do things because they genuinely do know better. And while I was thinking about this, it occurred to me that this pattern is very similar to something I came across uh, when I was training in hypnotherapy. So I've got a little bit of training in hypnotherapy. Um, and it's called Transactional Analysis. And this is a book I managed to get hold of called Games People Play. It's all about transactional analysis. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction. The idea of transactional analysis is that everybody plays one of three roles, parent, adult, or child. And when you're behaving like a parent, protecting the child, and these have capital P's, A's, and C's, these are roles people take on. Um, the parent-child relationship is a really interesting one. They're very useful roles sometimes, so being a parent helps us keep things safe, it helps us make things automated, it helps us control things. And being a child helps us be creative, it helps us have fun, right? All that jumping up and down we did first thing, it's quite childish, it's, it's good. But if we actually want to resolve problems, we occasionally need to behave like adults. And the adults are the people who observe and are generally impartial, and who accurately reflect what's really going on. So one of the games that people play is called If It Wasn't For Him. And the example Eric Byrne uses is, is um, there's a wife who's forced to stay at home by her husband and she says, oh, if it wasn't for him, I would be a successful businesswoman by now. But if the husband ever turned around to her and said, well, all right, go get a job, she'd be like, oh, I don't really want to. I'm quite happy being at home. So. The team frequently blame the scrum master, or the project manager, or the proxy product owner, or somebody else in a position of authority. So if it wasn't for them, we'd be successful. If it wasn't for her, we'd be fine. But secretly, especially the stressed team, and I've spoken to a few people about this, so I know it's true, and I've been a dev myself, so I know it's true, it can be quite comforting to just take something off the board, get it done. Take something off the board, get it done. Take something off the board, get it done. <coughs> Actively reaching out to collaborate with our customers. Actively creating a system that is forgiving. Takes a little bit more work than just letting these guys be parents to the team. And I reckon a lot of us just let this happen. Because it's nice. It feels safe. It's not your responsibility to make the project successful anymore. It's theirs. And they're the ones who get yelled at by the real product owner, by the incidental stakeholders. Not you. And there's something nice and childlike about that. What happens if we just take these guys out and make them not the interface? We might actually have to face up to some of our adult responsibilities. You make them part of the team. So don't let them be parents. Let them do their jobs as part of the team. And maybe you'll have better relationships with these guys. So I want to tell you about one of my teams that I've been working with, and I am very, very proud of this team. They were doing a planning meeting. This was last week. Halfway through the planning meeting, they realised they didn't have enough information to give an accurate estimate on what the product owner wanted. Now, I have seen Scrum teams before say things like, well, I'm sorry, if we don't have any clear acceptance criteria, we can't accept it into this sprint backlog, and push back and send them away. 
And what I had told them was, if there is uncertainty in requirements, it's probably because it's relatively high risk. And instead of pushing back, get it done more quickly. Find a way to give them something that they can then use to try out, to get feedback on. So half an hour in, they had decided they needed to run a couple of spikes, make a little prototype, see whether one of two options they had for going forward was the right way or not. And past that, they didn't know what was going to happen. But they knew it was going to take about a week. So our proxy product owner said, OK, no problem. I'll get in touch with the customers. I'll let them know that this is what's happening and that this is going to be our focus for the next two weeks. And we'll get back to them in a week and give them some more accurate information. And the team went, great. And he said, well, we're only half an hour into our planning meeting, but it feels like we're done. And the team went, yeah. It feels like we've got enough. And they left, having had this really adult conversation about reality. The only problem is that when we start doing this, we end up with far too much talking because now every single person in that team can talk to every single one of the stakeholders and the incidental stakeholders. And there's frequently, you know, 15 incidental stakeholders. So the other thing I wanted to do is talk about how, when you've got these forgiving systems, you can actually prevent that communication overload from happening and manage it a little bit. Um, just to give you an idea of how many incidental stakeholders there usually are, this is how I do value stream mapping. So this is how I map all of the stakeholders involved in a project. Um, I start with the dev team and I say, well, where do you get your requirements from? And they'll say things like, well, they come from the PMO office. And the PMO office gets them from a combination of the users and then these guys over here, you know, there's a company board, have some stuff they want done. And I say, well, they, is that where you get your budget from? And they'll say, oh no, there's a, a feasibility study that needs to happen. So I have one tr company I was working with, they said there was a feasibility study done six months ago to see whether this project was worth doing. I said, great, and did they approve the budget? And they said, yes, but the feasibility study needed their budget approved first. <laughs> You wonder why it takes so long to get stuff done in some organisations. Um, and then you look the other way and say, OK, who's going to stop you from going live? Who actually has an eye on you releasing this thing? Whose help do you need to get it out? And you trace it the other way. Now, the, these guys, these, these are what I call gatekeeping stakeholders, right? They, these will, they have gates that you have to get through. Um, if you're used to getting through those gates, it's fine. You probably don't need to talk to them too much. So if you know what the architecture is like, if you're used to chatting to the architects, if you know how to do um, security and stop SQL injection attacks, then you don't need to engage these guys again. It's tacit knowledge within the organisation. You've got plenty of people who are experts in it. You don't need to worry about it. But whenever you have a new stakeholder whose need you have never met before, they have something unusual, some new law has come in. What you can do is the BDD thing of getting them engaged up front. Ask them how they're going to check. If they don't give you an answer, go live anyway and watch what happens. <laughs> so real value streams are normally a lot more complicated than that. There are normally about eight to 10 people on the other side. One of the things I also do is that whoever I'm talking to, whoever has engaged me as a, as a consultant, I'll map their influence on that stream. Because everything outside is going to take longer to change. They can change things inside that boundary. That's their area of influence. But outside it takes a while. So this is the, the system within the system, right? It may be that when you talk to the product owner about, well, look, I want to change the way this team are interacting with you, they then say, well, to do that, you'll need to change the way that this department interacts with me. And those are conversations that if you're a coach, if you're a consultant, you can start kicking off nice and early if you're aware of them. And it's usually a lot more complicated than this. Okay, so here are the rules that I use for helping communication be done in an appropriate, low-cost way. If information is temporary, make it visible and easy to change. Stories are temporary. Fe 
features, once they are delivered, are permanent, unless they don't work, in which case you throw them away. The capabilities of a system are usually very permanent. And the term I use, the capability to comment on an article, the capability to make a copper trade, um, that maps to something Tom Gilp, Tom Gilp uses them as goals. And he's got ways of, of actually putting measurements on those that have nothing to do with whichever interface you use to deliver them. So if you're into Evo, if you're into to getting requirements really rigorous at a high level, I recommend. Um, make it visible and easy to change. Whiteboards are great. Um, my favourite system of choice is actually Jira because I don't know any other system that is so likely to drive people to use whiteboards. <laughs> I will say in their defence, the latest Green Hopper is an awful lot better than the previous one. <coughs> when information is permanent, it doesn't need to be so visible because it's not changing so fast, but make it easy to access. Put it on a wiki. Don't put it in email. If you put it in email, the next person who's new on the project will not be able to access it because they didn't get that email, right? So put it on a wiki. And if it's not important, then you get to use Twitter. <laughs> Just as a note, Twitter is the least respectful, least honest and least forgiving system that I have ever come across. It's hard to work out what on earth people are up to. It's 140 characters, so communication is necessarily terse. It's really easy to mistake people's motivations, and it's utterly public and therefore very unforgiving. So be careful what you put on Twitter. If you need a response, talk to someone. Find them, talk to them face to face. Make a phone call. Don't send them an email. Because by the time they answer the email, the thing that you wanted to talk to them about has gone from your mind, you've moved on to something else, and when you do get round to answering that email, serve they. So wherever possible, try to get a face-to-face -face conversation with people. And if you don't get a response, deliver something. There is nothing like being wrong to get people to tell you what right looks like. Okay? If any of you have blogs, you already know this principle. The number, of, the number of times I have managed to get people to give me an idea about what I was doing wrong because I was wrong on the internet. <laughs> so this came out yesterday. Um, we were talking about experiments and the roles of experiments off of the back of Jürgen's keynote. And Don Davis said, I'm not sure the business would, uh, I think it was meant to say, let me reclassify production now, which due to bad code is an experiment. And we were talking about the difference between experiments and mistakes. If it's not safe to fail, it's not an experiment. It's not forgiving. Right? So things which are safe to fail are forgiving. Things which aren't are mistakes. So I want to talk about some different types of software and explain why this forgiveness principle is so important. Because it's inevitable that we'll make mistakes. And some of you from yesterday are already starting to recognise this diagram, and I did promise I would go through it today. So, the first type of software we have is a differentiator. This is something which we do that is different to everybody else out there. Okay? So you have a think about this, you know, your project, your product, what you're working on, what makes the thing you're working on different to things other people are doing? What makes your company different to other companies? What makes you, as an individual, different to other people who are doing their, the same job? If you can find that differentiator, you found your niche, you found the thing that is most valuable about you. Um, I actually use the red moon as my symbol because when I was a child, my mum woke me up at two in the morning to go and see a lunar eclipse, an eclipse of the moon. Uh, nobody's woken me up at two in the morning to look at the full moon, even though it's brilliant. It's, it's about being different, not brilliant. So if we imagine we're Kyocera, we're making the world's first ever camera phone, right? And we, we've got a little video on it because we think people are going to use it to make video calls. We haven't seen or foreseen the rise of the duck face and the selfie. We're just making video calls. The 
phone also needs to do a bunch of other things. It needs to be able to make calls, receive calls, look up numbers, and do all the things that phones do. So sometimes in order to release something that is differentiating, to release a vision, you've got to have these really boring, commoditized things as well. User registration, logging in, things that we understand very, very well. Now you'll notice already that the risk in this product that I'm describing is right over here. It's with the differentiator. It's not with these commoditized ideas. We also sometimes have expedited software, and that's where we create some really urgent production bug, and you know we're losing money, we're losing customers, and our business is about to go bankrupt. Have any of you heard of night trading? Last year, they released something to production that was making really random trades against the stock market and they lost billions from it. Now, all the big companies apparently wound those transactions back. They went, yeah, it happens sometimes, and wound it all back, because they know one day it's gonna happen to them. All the small hedge funds went, no. Nope. So they lost quite a lot of money on it. Um, but they had to act to stem that blood flow. Now, I heard a rumor on the rumor mill, and I don't know how true it is, that what they actually did was release a test harness to production. So it was automated tests that were running these trades. Um, I told you automated testing is just really bad. Okay, so carters. Um, carters are very simple things. They're very predictable. They have very predictable outcomes. So we're talking about things like FizzBuzz, turning numbers into Roman numerals, small exercises that you can use to explore other types of things you do with software development. And we can do it because it's got very predictable outcomes. So over here, we have the very predictable outcomes. Over here, we have the unpredictable outcomes, the things that we can't possibly predict. Um, an example of something that I couldn't predict, uh, there was a multiplayer online game, and they wanted to entice people to come play the game. So they said, well, what we'll do is we'll share screenshots for this game. And they created a site where people could upload the screenshots. I'm guessing maybe they meant to connect it to the game later, but this was, you know, first iteration. Let's just make a site where people can upload the screenshots. And they found people were uploading pictures of kittens. It being the internet. And families. And holidays. And I'm sure they had a fair share of other photos they needed to act on. <laughs> um, but what they had accidentally done was to create a really great site for sharing photos. And that became Flickr. Started as an MMO. I'm working with a payment gateway provider who started an as, as an astrology site. Right? These things emerge. They are emergent outcomes in this space where we have these differentiators. So those of you who um, recognize it, oh yeah, and you get spoilers. So now everybody's got a camera phone, right? Everybody has a camera on their phone. So after a time, things get spoiled and understood, and there's more than one payment gateway provider. Those of you who hung out with me yesterday will recognize what this is. So I asked yesterday how many people have heard of Kenevin, and three people put their hand up. Then I wrote it down, and I said, so now how many people have heard of Kenevin? And nine people put their hand up. <laughs> so this is how you spell and pronounce Kenevin. It's a Welsh word. Okay, so Kenevin is basically this for all kinds of problems. You have simple problems that are easy, children can solve them, complicated problems that are still predictable but require expertise. So this is the equivalent of our user registration. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Ignore this, close your eyes. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we've got complex problems. So complex problems are ones which have emergent outcomes and then we have the chaotic problems, things we need to act on. So um, your house is burning down, accident and emergency. Eve does a great talk about houses burning down. He's experienced this. Um, and in the middle, we have what's called disorder, which is when you're not sure which of these domains dominate. So you tend to act according to your preferred domain. Now, Des, if you have a complicated problem where you need to press the same buttons over and over and over and over again, repeatedly, what's the first thing you do after you've done it three times? You automate it, right, because devs hate complicated problems, but we love turning them into different complex problems. So devs tend to work in the complex space. 
Testers, hands up testers. A few of you, congratulations. Um, I have no idea how you managed to do that over and over and over again. I simply don't have the patience. But you're, you're more comfortable working in the complicated space. Um, people who are used to accident and emergency, um, they'll work in a chaotic space and they drill for it. So if you've read The Phoenix Project, which is an amazing book, by the way, um, then you'll know they drill for things going wrong. Um, and command and control actually works really, really well in that space, in the chaos space. There's a little cliff at the bottom here. Along this border between simplicity and chaos is complacency. And it's very easy to fall over the cliff, as night trading discovered. It's very hard to get back the other way. So we know that breaking things down, when it's made up of parts, and you can take the parts and put them back together again, it's, it's, it's useful there. So there's a thing called frog thinking versus bicycle thinking. Have you heard of that? So the idea is you can take a bicycle to pieces and put it back together again. You can't do that with a frog. <laughs> Frogs are complex. In complex spaces, we have to be able to try things out. We have to be able to run experiments. And if it's not safe to fail, it's not an experiment. So there's this great book called Commitment, which I'm sure people are going to talk about later today. Um, I'm in it. I turn up on page 76. It's a graphic novel. It's about a, a lady called Rose who's trying to save her project from being shut down. Um, if you've ever read The Goal by Eliya Goldratt about theory of constraints, it's a, also a great book with a similar kind of plot. He's trying to stop his factory from being shut down. So this is that, but it's a graphic novel, and it's particularly about the decisions we make. So I told you that breaking things down doesn't work in a complex space. But I also broke everything down for you. I told you about feature injection and how I break down projects. And it produces this lovely fractal beauty. And when we do projects, we tend to go down the pub, we tend to go to the restaurant, we have a beer in our hand, and we talk about how amazingly well that project went, right? No, we don't. Of course we don't. Real projects don't look like this. Here's what a real project looks like. We forgot a bit. And we didn't know about that bit. And it turns out that these guys are all connected. And we found something out, and we realized we didn't need that bit. And we can't remember what that bit's for. And it turns out that as we go on, <laughs> this is what a real project looks like. It's what Dan Northwood calls these oh crap moments. <laughs> this is what a project really looks like. All these times we discover something, and the reason we discover things is because we're doing things which are new, which we haven't done before. The Agile Manifesto says, we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. I was actually going through the waterfall paper and looking at the waterfall paper, and it turns out that if you replace his emphasis on documentation with an emphasis on human readable code, it actually looks, his recommendations look an awful lot like Agile. Nobody paid any attention to them, mind. But it actually starts to look like a lot like Agile. So we've been doing this for a while. We've known how to develop software for a very long time. This isn't Agile's differentiator. This isn't what Agile really does. We're uncovering better ways of discovering stuff. And discovering it early and quickly. While there is still time to forgive us while we still have time to react to the things we discover. And that is Agile's differentiator. Agile is a forgiving methodology. At least if you don't do Scrum by the book, by the book, by the book. The different levels of granularity are there because it shows you which system you're in, who you need to talk to, how to create that interface, which interface to concentrate on. Okay, so I wanted to talk very quickly about experiment design and how to actually make this stuff happen and make these things forgiving. Because it's not always that easy. 
One of the things that cognitive edge likes to do is to take a small shallow dive into chaos. So um, it turns out that conflict is actually really quite cool. If you've got lots and lots of diverse opinions, especially if they are strongly held, some of them are likely to be right. So if you can get massive loads of diverse opinions together, and then look at those diverse opinions and keep them diverse, which is really hard, because as soon as you get people in a room together, they tend to collapse and tend to come up with consensus. If you can keep those opinions, you will have better experiments. Um, there was a great article, I think it was the New York Times, that it called Snowfall. Lovely graphics, lovely um, you know, mix of videos and everything like this. I think it won awards. But it was about these expert skiers who all went up on a mountain together and every single one of them was worried that it would, there would be an avalanche. And not one of them said anything. Because they collapsed into this group thing. Individually, they were all right, but as a group, they made a terrible decision. They, weren't, they didn't feel able to express their individual opinion, and they relied on the group, and not one of the group actually said anything, and a ton of them died. They were experts. So keeping these very shallow, these, these chaotic, diverse opinions, just at a shallow level, can be useful for creating the experiments. So I wanted to talk about one way they do that. Um, Cognitive Edge have this thing called Ritual Descent. You can go to their website and read it. Um, their material is all CC, so Creative Commons, you can use it. Um, it's very similar to a pattern that Linda Rising taught me called Fly on the Wall. So the idea is you come up with your experiment. I want to run this experiment. And you explain it to a couple of people. They are not allowed to talk to you. I introduce a, a rule that they're allowed to say, could you repeat that? Could you say it again? But they're not allowed to ask questions because that's interaction. And as soon as you start interacting, you start getting consensus. So they're not allowed to ask questions. You present the idea. You tell them why you think it's a realistic experiment to run that might help how you are going to amplify it, do it more if it works, how you are going to dampen it and stop it if it fails. And then you either turn your back to the group or you put a mask on so they cannot see your face, they cannot see your emotions. And then the group acts as though you are not there and they rip your experiment to pieces. They tell you why it's gonna fail, why it's gonna be dangerous and won't be safe why you're not going to be able to do anything with it if it does work. And from that, you come up with better ideas and different ideas. So as an example, we were looking at the problem of communication across distributed teams. And I came up with the idea of teaching them all to do haiku. And one of the guys in this experiment said, um, you know, in this ritual descent thing said, you might as well get them to, to, to all commit ritual harakari, I think it is, where they stab themselves with a sword in the stomach. <laughs> I mean, it's that silly. And I thought, well, actually, if the problem is that they can't own up to mistakes, what if we made it a silly ritual with a plastic sword? That might actually be quite fun. So now we've got another idea for another experiment. And your experiments can be very silly. Um, one of the things they like to do is to invite people from other disciplines in to come up with experiments because they'll think of things that we don't because we've got these consensus brains. So anyway, that's one way of doing it. Here's the other way I do it. And this is because I've been using real options for a while. Whenever we have a problem. I like to tell a story about a problem, and I'll give it a title where I say, this is the one where. So if you think of a problem you've encountered, or a discovery you made that you wish you'd known earlier, this is the one where Liz brought down the Guardian travel site for three hours. It wasn't actually as panicked as I felt like it was, but it, it felt like chaos to me. I really didn't like it. So, okay, this is the one where Liz brought down the Gaudian travel site for three hours. We look at the moments of commitment, and there's usually actually more than one of them. Um, so let's look at the moments of commitment. We decided to use a subset of production data. That was the first thing we did wrong. 
we committed to that. Not real production data, but just a subset of it. Um, and then I checked in the code, which was going to do this new thing on the travel site, along with the scripts that changed the database. And then we went live with that. And then a couple of seconds later, the whole of the travel site went down because I would removed a unique constraint that was still being used by a piece of code and we hadn't realized. So there was another moment of commitment where we went live as well. And you can identify those moments and go, OK, was there a way to reasonably have predicted that problem? Was there anything we could have done to get information that would have helped us to make a different decision? So I could have got real realistic data. OK. And then you can say, was there any way of making a decision safe? Is there anything we could have done that would have meant going live wasn't an issue. Well, we could have introduced rollback. Rollback's one of my favourite safety nets. Being able to flip back a production database, being able to flip back a, a, a rollout of code and just go, OK, let's not use that anymore, means that releasing is no longer a commitment. It's an experiment. I had this couple of people turn up at Extreme Tuesday Club in London and they said, you know, they were very nervous. I said, hey, come on in. You all right? And they said, yeah, we're, we're not sure we belong here. And I said to them, how come? And they said, we're not sure we're agile enough. <laughs> I said, well, OK. Um, tell me how often you release to production. And I'm expecting them to say something like once every six months and get a consulting gig out of it. They said um, three, four, six times. I said, whatever. They said, no, a day. <laughs> I said, well, you're all right then. How on earth did you manage to get to the point where you were releasing six times a day, but you didn't realise you were agile? And it turned out their founders had quite an academic background and liked running experiments. And they ran experiment after experiment after experiment until they got to the point where they could just release. And they said, as soon as the complaints started coming in, the software would automatically switch back. So if they got too many, you know, a couple of customers complaining, that was it they realised that they'd done something wrong with the release. So they didn't even do that much automated testing. They didn't even do that much manual testing because they had monitoring in place and they were able to switch back really easily. So identifying those moments of commitment and looking to see either how can we get that information earlier or how can we keep our options open so that this decision is not a commitment? If anyone wants to talk to me more about that, um, I'd probably wait till the open space is tomorrow because I think some other people are going to talk about real options too. And it's probably worth going and seeing what they have to see, as I say. Um, but it's one of my favourite principles and it's a brilliant way of introducing forgiving systems. Look to see what would make the commitments safe. If you can make forgiving systems, you don't need forgiving people because there's nothing to forgive. Liz brought the Guardian travel site down for 0.05 seconds. That would have been so nice. So whenever you're feeling like you're having to be nice to somebody in order to make things work, have a look at your systems. Have a look at what's making them harsh, what's making them unforgiving, what's making the interface that you are presenting to other people be an unforgiving one, be an unrealistic one. What can you do to make it more transparent? What can you do to make things safe to fail, to make it okay to run experiments instead of looking for permission all the time? Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank Microsoft for not restarting my computer during that talk. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? I know we're over time, just by a few minutes. You're all desperate for coffee. I understand. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz.